The following interview was conducted with Bruce Cooley, president of the Purdue Foundation Student uh, Board for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Monday, April 5th, 2010 in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Good morning, Bruce, and thank you very much for this opportunity. Please tell us about uh, where and when you were born and your parents in early years. Okay. Um, that's the easy part, I guess. Yeah. Uh, well, my name is Bruce Lawrence Cooley, and I say that first to say that I'm pretty proud of my middle name. My, my dad and I, uh, my dad passed down that middle name um, to me, so that's kind of a neat family heritage there. Um, but I'm the youngest of seven uh, children, I guess, to my dad, Newton Alice Cooley. Grew up in a, kind of a rural community, not on a farm by any means, but since there were seven of us, pretty large family, we literally raised just about everything we we um, we ate. I mean, we had about an acre garden, and and we had you know the chickens, the rabbits, the cattle, the the the, the goats, the sheep, everything. It was kind of a small hobby farm, and uh, we learned very young uh, about harvesting animals, <laughs> and uh, so it was a lot of fun in in that respect. And um, where'd you fall in line with the you are the youngest or the oldest, or are you in between? Yep, I was the youngest of all, all the seven. So I was born on October fifteenth of nineteen eighty six. Okay. And uh, the first one was born 12 years later, basically. So it's kind of interesting where after my birthday, it's the latest in the year, we're all just about two years apart. As I'm, <laughs> Right now, I'm 23, the next one up is 25, the next one up 27, and so on, all the way up to 35. So that's been a lot of fun. I already have 11 nieces and nephews, which has been a blast. <laughs> um, and I uh, really enjoyed that. I, feel, I, I count that as a big blessing in life. Uh, the difficult part about, uh, I guess, growing up was around sixth grade, my parents, after seven children and, and 20, 27 years of marriage, got a divorce. And I still don't understand that to this day, but that was a huge shift in, in family dynamics and caused a big, big change in life. Where, where, where about what town were you born in again? Uh, Greenfield, Indiana. Oh, Greenfield. Sorry, okay, Greenfield, go Indiana. Okay, so go east ahead. of Indianapolis. Right. And um, so that was a big family dynamic shift. And that really changed how I looked at life. And I remember very specifically about that time, my, my oldest brother, Josh, which is 10 years older than I, um, had just dropped out of college, basically, because he was trying to work. He was trying to, to go to school for architecture, and well, he was trying to live the college life. And it's all those things that, that you know the typical college guy may or may not might, might do. So I remember a conversation in sixth grade where, where Josh told me, uh, Bruce, if you want to go to college, you've got to get it paid for. And uh, my parents didn't go to college. In fact... Um, no one else in my, my family went to college except for myself and my next oldest sister, Joni. And I'll always remember that conversation with Josh because that oh, yeah, was right. the... That's really key. It was key, yeah. It was, it was um, that truly was, was the pivotal point in my life as far as academics and, and kind of um, the gumption to push a little harder and, and push the limits and, and do things. And I, I owe a lot to Josh, and, and um, that's been a lot of fun. That's been a fun conversation to have with him off and on. So... Um, so that kind of leads all the way through the middle school age, but and I mentioned that shift. And another big nugget to mention as far as high school development was um, FFA. Uh, so it used to be called the Future Farmers of America. It's not that any longer. FFA is simply an acronym that stands for Premier Leadership, Personal Growth, and Career Success, which is a, a great student organization. In fact, it's the largest student-ran organization in the world at about a half a million members in uh, the 50 it's states. Been around and, for so long, mm -hmm. and it's so many people, I've, even retiree faculty, mm -hmm. used to, that's where they first heard about Purdue. They came here. Yep. Yeah, 1928 was when it first came around. So, right. And Indiana had their, chap, their charter for an association in, in 1929. So it's, it's been very interesting. But, but in that, I, I got involved my freshman year with FFA because, simply because my brother, uh, the, my middle brother, I've got two older brothers, uh, so Hans, my middle brother Hans, which is six years older than I, um, did really well in soils judging. So judging a profile of soil based on different characteristics for different applications. And he got to go to a national contest for it. And I, I thought that was the coolest thing in the world. So that's the only reason I got involved in FFA. And, and that was truly uh, another pivotal point in my life as far as an organization that helped catapult me into thinking more critically about um, what you can and can't do. And I mean that on a lot of different levels, both on the, well, I mean, the the, the three things that, that we talk about in FFA, the premier leadership, personal growth, and career success, and had great mentors in there. I had two different agriculture advisors uh, during that time. First was Jeff Geiger, and then the second was Scott Jacobs. And, uh, Jeff, and, and Scott Jacobs and I still talk. He's still one of my biggest mentors and still one of my biggest cheerleaders, you might say. Right, that's great. And um, 
that was a great thing. And also around that time, it, with my parents' divorce, it became easier for me to kind of support myself. So um, I started doing that. I was working a lot for a veterinarian and uh, just a, a great man. Uh, his name was Dr. John Hunt, a phenomenal man, and I owe, owe a lot to him. He's a Purdue graduate from the vet, vet program in 1967, um, so it was Funny. shortly after it started, which is pretty neat. And uh, just a great man both on the, the business side, both on uh, the veterinary side, and, and also, more importantly, on the mentor side. Um, he, he's older, obviously, but he, he didn't act like a grandfather. He's more of just kind of that wise friend you could talk to. And I remember a lot of nights um, we'd get done doing the work and we'd go in his office and we'd just talk about life or this or that and the other. And he really helped kind of push me and develop me uh, into the man I am today, uh, both on... Um, both on the work ethic and more importantly on the faith-based values of, you know, you could have the best work ethic in the world, but if you don't have a purpose for doing it, you really don't have anything. So um, that was, that was a, another pivotal point, I guess, this is just FFA and the mentors. And then fast forwarding one more nugget before I get to college was um, actually some further things that I did with FFA. Uh, I was blessed with the opportunity to be the state president for the Indiana FFA Association for 2005 and 2006. So the year I graduated, 2005, until um, 2006, the next June, then I started Purdue in the fall of 2006. So I had a, a year internship there where um, it was just a phenomenal opportunity. Like I mentioned, I keep mentioning this, the premier leadership, personal growth, and career success, but I got to be a, um, my own cheerleader, you might say, or the state's cheerleader for those three things to 10,000 students across Indiana put about 36,000 miles on a vehicle in just a, uh, about six months and um, went all over the state with six other individuals that were in a similar role than, that I was in. And we got to talk about agriculture and youth role in it, also leadership and youth role in that. And the most fun part about that was pushing young people that were our own age and a little younger to achieve their potential, to not only set, settle for the status quo. And, and um, those things were possible because of the, the background that I had with with both my family with Josh and that conversation and and with uh, the having to work all the time and meeting Dr. Hunt and and his mentorship and, and uh, Scott Jacobs, my ag advisor, his mentorship and pushing me, pushing me, pushing me. And when we got to college, it was just a great catapult to to um, really find the things I was passionate about and jump into them. Good. How did you have, did you uh, feel that you wanted to come to Purdue because of the agriculture? Is that why you decided to come to Purdue? So, um, that's a big question, I guess, for me, and, and, and the reason that is is because uh, a couple different things. First off, uh, I, with that, that conversation with Josh back in sixth grade, that, that nugget there as far as going to college and needing to get it paid for, um, that was really my target. That was, uh, that was where my eye was, in a sense, on the horizon. Um, I really tried to push on, on that and tried to, do, I tried to, to find scholarships and things, and I filled out, my goodness, just countless scholarships my senior year. And I was really blessed with one in particular called the Lilly Scholarship. And uh, that paid for tuition at a state school. And that was just, I mean, that was icing on the cake. I, I, did, you get, did you get it? Yeah, I, I got that. And I, I, don't, I still don't think I deserve it. I don't know. It's one of those things. But, but I got it. But it was an amazing opportunity. Sure. And um, it just, that, that was just phenomenal. And I've been blessed with with other scholarships that have helped me through school. But, but that one, why I mentioned that one in coming to Purdue is I knew I, was, I wanted to be connected with agriculture and I knew engineering was kind of the, the idea where I wanted to go or at least where I thought I wanted to go, that problem solution um, type of thinking and that, that different way of thinking really. So Purdue was kind of the natural choice because um, it, 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 yeah, it's just it, the natural it, choice. Yep. Right, exactly. And uh, did you did they have Dan? Uh, did you come for Dan on campus? I didn't. Oh, so okay. all through FFA, I, I was up here at Purdue for right. four years. Uh, I knew quite a few people at Purdue, and and um, also uh, I during that year with FFA, I was up here a lot for different things that, that we did there, and I actually took some college credits, some independent research credits during that time. Uh, which was, was fun. So I, I, it was already, already there on the horizon. I already knew about it, and I just kind of shot for it. I've interviewed somebody else whose name is Casey, who was FFA but president for the state thing, and or talked to them. You really have to take a year off because yeah. it's a, it, it takes a lot of time. It's it does. You can't really be in school and do that. No, you, okay. you, you really can't. Right. Um, some other states you have will so do that. So many represent and so many events and things that you need to be there. Mm -hmm. 
Yep, other states, there are, are 50 states, all 50 states in the United States, and then uh, Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands have FFA associations. So your, your state is an association, uh, each state is, and then there's the, the national FFA organization. So that's just a, a quick housekeeping thing. Yeah. There are a few states that, that require their students to take off a year, and those states that do that, their programming for FFA and the opportunities that they have for high school students as far as interfacing with state officers is head over heels better than than other states and, th and that that has been it that's that is the reason that that is or that's why that's been able why we've been able to do that is because of very generous donations that help support the state organization and and push it forward so that's great so it works yeah. out very well yeah it does right. it sure does let's talk a little bit about purdue then and your major uh again tell me what you're majoring your uh, activities and then we'll talk about the purdue foundation student board okay so major activities and yeah okay. and then we'll talk and talk about that a couple of things on the uh, challenges for that but what's your major and uh any of the other activities that you've been involved in. Mm -hmm. okay. So first off with my major, uh, there's a quick fun story here. Good. Um, I graduated high school in 2005 and I was accepted into Purdue for engineering, XYZ, you know, fill in the blank and that's what I was going to do. And um, that in itself is an interesting conversation but probably perhaps not for this. It's all right. Well, I'll leave it up to you. What okay. So as a quick side story, I mentioned Purdue was kind of the natural choice. It was the natural choice for engineering. I actually had three applications out, one to Indiana Westland for business and youth ministry, one for Bethel Bible College for Christian ministry, and the third for Purdue Engineering, and I was going to join a fraternity. So all three of those had the same focus. It was just funny how, how it came about. But back to the question, um, I'm majoring in agricultural and biological engineering. Um, as I said, I got accepted into that, but during that year out with FFA, I got it in my mind that I couldn't be an engineer and be social, uh, or I couldn't be an engineer and really interface with people, and that's, that's my lifeblood, that's what gets me excited, and that's, that's really my passion, and that's where my heart is. So um, before I even came, I switched degrees to agricultural economics, but I, I chose to do that very strategically and take the engineering math that applied both for economics and engineering. So I, I did that, for, so for the first year I was in economics. And I loved it, but it wasn't challenging. Like, I would just go to class and study an hour or two, and I, I'd do okay on the exams. Sure. And um, I was like, ah, I don't know sure this is what college is about. So uh, for some reason, <laughs> I switched to engineering at the end of my, my freshman year and have been doing that since. And, and um, that's caused a lot of challenges. It's, uh, I mentioned my hardest with people. Junior year was not a fun year. Uh, just It was all engineering classes, a lot of homework. Um, did my worst academically, and that was very that was a huge knife, a huge wound in my pride, if, if you will, right. and that was a humbling experience. In itself. Well, you decided but, to go to AB, uh, agro and biological and yep. engineering. Okay. Yep, right. I decided to go to that because that that was a neat program. The faculty within that program are just phenomenal, and that program isn't so focused on one particular area. Um, I've been able to take courses in different schools, in the nuclear engineering school, and the mechanical engineering school, and and uh, and. I mean, civil engineering is taking a lot of credits in civil engineering, and you know, you get a, you get a, an electrical engineering even, you get a wide gamut of information from different types of uh, educational backgrounds, because we all know professors are usually very narrowly focused on their specific area, and that's great when you're wanting to learn about that specific area. But when my objective is to learn how to learn differently and learn how to think differently and um, more inter interdisciplinary. Yeah, yeah, I wanted the inter interdisciplinary sure. program, but um, with the uh, accreditation background backing if that makes sense so ABE or agricultural and biological engineering seem to be the, the perfect choice so um, now to the student organization component of this the best advice that I, best and worst advice I guess you could say it's a double-edged sword that I got before college was to get involved get involved get involved and I remember a conversation With over 800 you can't lose around here <laughs> yeah that's for sure you can find a little bit of anything right. and um, I, I remember meeting with a man by the name of Brandon Schaefer. Now, he went to, uh, to Iowa State, but we had a very similar background as far as our passions, our convictions, and things. Mm -hmm. So uh, I talked with him um, in the spring of 2006. He's like, Bruce, get involved in three organizations that, that you are really passionate about and maybe two club organizations that are just fun to do, that there are no commitments other than like maybe showing up and hanging out with guys and having a fun time. So... Um, He's like, but, you know, really keep it down to three organizations that are going to require your time. I was like, oh, well, you know, I, I could do more than this. So <laughs> I got involved with perhaps too many things in uh, my freshman year. And 
and have continually cut back since then. Of course, I've picked up a few other things that I'm pretty passionate about, but have cut back from them. And, and during the time, I'll, I'll just kind of hit some of the random ones, then I'll go to the, the ones that are really important to me, I guess. Uh, I've been involved with Farmhouse Fraternity, and that's fairly important. And um, also Greek InterVarsity and uh, Purdue Christian Campus House. Um, I've been involved with um, the Purdue Foundation Student Board, of course, Purdue, stu- Purdue Student Government, um, uh, agricultural ambassadors, some I'm, I'm missing, I just haven't th- thought about for a long That's time. Quite a few. That's uh, ag ambassadors and um, yeah, those, I, those since I can remember those, those are the right. key ones, yeah. That's good. And I've really enjoyed all of those organizations, but uh, the ones that have really stuck out are, of course, Purdue Foundation Student Board and um, yeah, I, really, that's the biggest organization. Right. That's all we're going to talk about. Uh, mm-hmm. Some of the uh, challenges and issues and programs, and also to, for researchers, tell what the, the, the board is, the Purdue, what yeah. the nature of the board mm-hmm. is. Okay. So the the, the nature of Purdue Foundation Student Board is a student board that, uh, that is uh, selected actually by nomination by the, from their peers and faculty members to represent Purdue to a very specific group of alumni. And that alumni group is the President's Council. So to put it in perspective, the President's Council are, are, are alumni that have donated more than $1,000 annually to Purdue for various reasons, for different building funds, for you know the general programming. So they get to be in this group. Now, uh, just to give you an idea of the company uh, of this group, you've got uh, the nice swingers that have just built a, 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 a hangar, basically. They're in this group. and. And um, you've got Pete and Sally Kay, which are in this group. You've got the Dalks, which are in this group. And, and, and those are just some big names that, that um, are actually buildings are named after them. So they're, they're big name people. They're donors. So they're donors, yeah. Right. So um, these 25 to 35 students in Purdue Foundation Student Board represent Purdue, the Purdue student body to this group of, of alumni. So it's a, a great honor. It's a ton of fun. And um, it, it's fun because we, we have the opportunity to, to get stuff done and make sure that the events kind of uh, happen well and we, we kind of are able bodies that, that, that uh, do the work that needs done and make things happen well. But also we get to interface with alumni. and It's fun because sometimes we're the only face that they see at the university that's not at breakfast club doing something silly when they drove into campus. So that's, that's a lot of fun. So um, Let me stop you for a yeah. second. Were you on the board? Before I mean, before you were elected president. Mm-hmm. Okay, you might want to mention that you you were a member of the board. Yep. Okay. I was I, actually at the conclusion of this year. I will be will have been a member for three years, okay. and I'm going to continue on for this next semester. So in effect, I would have been on the board for three and a half years. Good. So uh, I did one year as a junior board member, so just a general member, and I did um, one year as the vice president of, of public relations my my junior year, and I did one year as the president, which I'm currently in. Which was a fun progression, but um, so that's the the nature of the board. Um, with that comes some some big challenges. So I mentioned a few moments ago that that was uh, a board that's nominated by both our peers and faculty. And the fun part about that is you've got leaders leading leaders, which is fun. It's a lot of fun. It really is, but it brings some challenges. And with it that, it, yeah, it should. I mean, it, you've got in a sense you could say. Uh, the adage has been said that you, you know have too many chiefs and not enough Indians, and it's fun because, uh, on one hand, it's fun because when things need done, they get done, and on the other hand, it's very difficult because when you're trying to corral all these people into one mindset of pro- with one purpose and one mission, uh, that gets difficult, and um, that's a challenge. It gets challenging. Difficult. Yeah, right. it is, yeah. and also with people that that uh, have been nominated, usually they're the busiest people. They usually uh, have. I mean. Besides academics, which are strenuous enough, they're usually involved and in, maybe overly involved in different organizations. What I've found is a lot of them are sleep deprived, which makes them sometimes edgy, <laughs> at least maybe from personal experience. That's what I think. And so the challenge of that is busyness, and actually um, we can get things done, but, but kind of monitoring the health, I guess, of your organization, the, the physical health of not getting people worn too, too thin or drug too thin. So, so that was probably the biggest challenge as far as when we have these different events, making sure that, that um, we, we just have, we take care of each other in a sense, but also make sure that things happen. So um, with that challenge comes a pretty big victory, and that has been delegation and getting, uh, getting a lot of minds around one idea. 
So after a short time within the board, you'll find out the different people that work well together. You'll find out the different personalities. And that's where, where my heart my mind kick in. I love to match people with um, different projects. We had one young lady that, that just was a phenomenal planner. She is, if I had to pick her career right now, and this is completely unjust, I don't even think she's going to be doing this, but if I had to pick her career, she'd be a great event planner. Like she just thinks of the details, she makes it happen. She uh, is very quiet, very reserved, just, just a sweetheart of a girl. But when it needs done, she will be in your face and ask you to get it done. She's not afraid to ask for help. And we saw that, and we had an event called uh, the Old Masters event where we invited Bob Bowen, which is a member of the President's Council, to, to speak at one of our, uh, to speak at a dinner. So we, we saw her and we knew that she had some time and we asked her to do it and she just took off right with it. And which was a great thing because you're kind of empowering the people within your organization. Which and you brings, also picked, you made the selection too. You yeah, that, right? yeah, and, and you, you uh, in a sense, are, are uh, growing people to be the next generation of leaders. And the fun part was that happened last fall. And now she, with the executive interviews that we just had this spring, she's now an executive officer, conveniently as the vice president of events. So it, it, that, even though there are challenges with busyness and leaders and, and things of that nature, there are a lot of successes with that too. So um, f for the organizations that I've been involved in, uh, I would dare say as far as student organizations, that, that are based on nomination and application, uh, this would be my favorite, and um, this will be the organization that has the most fond memories, and for for my preference, is the best organization on campus. But Were there any new I'm programs biased. that uh, do people start this year? Or was any specific one, any new program? The challenge this with this year was all the volatility with both the economy, which okay. then led into donations, which then led into that's programming and finding because funds. That's what's going on, mm -hmm. and that's why the students, the other ones I've interviewed, this is what campus life and what was going on yeah. at, in your particular organization. Yeah, and that's that's exactly what it is. And to that, uh, with the volatility of the time, that's just caused a, a lot of challenges. I mean, money is just a challenge. We have we have both of our club account, and also we work with the development office, university of development office. So we have an account that that we ha that helps out there as well. So we've been able to do most of well, we've been able to do all of our program that we typically do each year. But as far as new programs, that's a challenge. Um, there was a program that we started last year called the Purdue Heroes Project, and um, that recognizes unsung heroes of the university. It doesn't necessarily need to be doesn't necessarily have to be faculty, but could be. But more so are people within the that make up the life of the university that are really doing great things that don't necessarily get the recognition. The challenge with that is finding funding for both the awards and also the banquet. So well, did you do it just at one event or was it, uh, you, sorry, you had a special event just for the heroes? Mm -hmm. so, yep, it was a special okay. event last year that we did last spring. Um, actually the Iron Key chapter did it uh, and the president last year, Jill Steiner, was uh, on Iron Key and she, uh, PFSB, Purdue Foundation Student Board, uh, it was just kind of the natural transition that that would be a good, good organization to continue that on. And funding has been the challenge with that this year. Um, we're wanting to make it bigger and better and kind of put our own taste on it, which comes with some neat ideas. And actually, that's what my hope is to do next uh, next fall. That'll be my individual special project to push that even harder, write some grants, maybe try to find some, some funding for that program, some continual funding. So we aren't in this position every year where we're like, well, where are we going to get it's it That's a nice thing. Of so, all those people, were there some faculty? Um, how many people were you, did you have in the group of the heroes last year that you recognized? Was it quite a few? Um, honestly, I was a little biased. Uh, one of my fraternity brothers named John Romine passed away from Hodgkin's lymphoma. And uh, uh, he passed away on December 5th of 2008. And, uh, yeah, 2008. So uh, he was actually recognized as an unsung hero for things that he's done on the campus. And uh, a, better, a better example of a, a young man I've, I've not found. And also with him, Brent Bible, which is our house advisor. And, and he basically, he, he's a younger guy in his mid-30s, late 30s actually, um, retired from the state police force because of an accident that happened there, but basically just became a, a surrogate father, if you will, to John and, and things that happened there. And I remember those two and their story, of course, more vividly than the rest. And sure. to be quite honest, that has overshadowed the others that are there. So um, I don't think I could really speak well of. Yeah, that, uh, but it's of nice that comment. It's more personal than that. Yeah, it look back really on. was personal. Right. Uh, leadership. I think you've addressed some of it, but you saw some leader's role in academia and the professional. Yeah, um, as I was thinking about this question last sure. night, something came up that was 
well, it's a pet peeve of mine. There are different classes, there are different types of courses on the university, and I'm not talking about type in the sense of engineering versus liberal arts. I'm talking more so on the type of the way of thinking and the way the class is structured. In my mind, there are two ways to, to teach a course, and, and that's either to teach someone how to learn, how to think, how to do things on their own, or teach someone that they need to regurgitate for the test to get the A. And I, of course, prefer the first, that is to learn how to learn. And, Is it uh, more lifelong learning, would you say? Yeah, it's more lifelong learning, and that's what provides the, the, uh, the catapult for student success. Because when you teach somebody that you know, 2 plus 2 is 4 and all they have to do is memorize the answer is 4, you don't really get anywhere. But if you teach them how to get that answer, that's a math term, engineering, whatever. If you teach them how to get that answer, that's something that lasts, and that's something that's really, uh, really exciting. That's what, what academics is about. So in this question of leadership, I think academics' role in leadership is to push away from this regurgitation and teach people how to learn and how to think critically and how to do, to do things. Yeah, to analyze. That's what it's all about. And um, as a 23-year-old college student, I don't know how to do that best. There are people that write dissertations on, on this top, very topic, <laughs> and I'll leave it to them. I'll leave it to the experts. But as far as leadership in, our, in academia, that is where I think it is. And with that comes role models. Um, for me, in engineering, I have the, the blessing and the curse to have a lot of good professors and a lot of not-so-good professors as far as on the academic sense. Uh, every single one of them know the cur curriculum. They know the material. But I've sat in classrooms where we literally derived an entire equation, derived an equa uh, one equation for the entire class period, and all we need to, needed to know was that equation. And that's, that's what we needed to know. And... Uh, we, we didn't necessarily need to know all the mathematical uh, proofs to get there. We know that we've taken enough calculus to get there. Sure, it's good to know, but I'm not sure 50 minutes was uh, justifiable to, to go through that derivation. When we have the equation, when it's in the book, we can, we can go through that if we want to. Uh, but the professor was so driven on math. Like that's where he, It was an engineering class on, um, on hydraulics, actually. And so water flow. And that's important for hydraulics, but, but we could have learned so much more content there. And it was all, the entire class was very theoretical. There wasn't a lot of application. Now, the professor does a lot of application in the real world but uh, in, in, his, in his studies, but didn't show through the class. On the other hand, I had a professor that taught a similar course in hydraulics, and uh, he brings a lot of real-world experience. You know, when I was doing a project on the Wabash River, we were doing this, this, and this, and this is why this is important. When professors start to talk like that and actually care about the connection between the material and their student, students, that's when remarkable things happen, and that's when exam averages uh, really just excel. Sure. Um, to put it in perspective, the first professor, the very theoretical professor, the first exam average that we had was 23%. That was the most discouraging class I've ever had. The, the highest average on, in that class was a 43%. We had three exams, and that was the highest average. Now, uh, did a little better than that, but that's, in my mind, that's not acceptable. Something's going wrong there. The other professor I mentioned that really connected and related, the exam averages are in the 80 percentile. And the content is very similar, but the professor is very realistic about it. He's like, you don't need to know the derivation. Someone's already done that. If you're interested in that, you could look it up. The important part is the equation and why the equation works and how it works. And, um, more in depth. And, yeah, more, yeah, it's more mm -hmm. practical, more world world. Sure. And if we're preparing to Mars leaders here at college, I think that's the type of application we need. But I'm biased. Yeah. So How about uh, the next thing is on a president's form, you know, I, I gave you those things. Any comments on uh, Keith Crotch? Which one, any comments on those? He gave those at the president's forum. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Um, we've gotten have you to, met him? We've gotten to interact, interact a lot with Keith, Keith okay. Crotch. We have one big event each, well, we have a lot of big events each to fall with Purdue Foundation Student Board. One of those is the Student Leader Barbecue, where we invite all the student leaders across campus to, to be at one location and hear a phenomenal speaker like Keith Crock and uh, give his presentation. And, and he, he basically gave a very similar presentation last October when we did our event. And um, I, I just love what he, what he highlights here. And the reason I love it is <laughs> kind of because of my work in FFA. When I was, after I was done with the, the time with uh, the Indiana FFA in 2006, I actually was going to run for national FFA office. And I, I worked a lot with my, my, uh, biggest mentor in high school, my ag advisor, Scott Jacobs. And in that we, 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 um, we came about these three words that really encompassed why I wanted to do national office and what drove me, and they were engage, 
encourage, empower. And they were in that order because when you meet someone, you have the opportunity to engage them. And once you engage them, you get to know them, you get to have real conversations, not the superficial junk about, oh, what do you think about the basketball game? And that's okay, and that has its place. But, but when you exactly truly engaging. engage somebody, you're talking about things that are important. And when you talk about things that are important, you figure out how to empower, you figure out how to encourage them, and you figure out what motivates them and what, or where they need that encouragement, really. And when you, based on that encouragement, you can actually give that and you get to empower them for just a moment. And the fun thing about those conversations and that, that, those three little words um, is after those conversations, the person really doesn't have any more money in their pocket. They really don't have any more, they don't have nicer clothes or worse clothes, or they aren't really out anything except for time. And the biggest thing that you've given them is that encouragement, that empowerment to do something greater, just that little bit of a nudge to say, you can do it. And I think that, 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 um, that phrase, you could do it or you're enough, is what my generation needs the most of just that little bit of a push to say, hey, you know, you say this is your goal. Well, you know, I believe in you. As an older, for me, as, as an older man, for an older man telling me that, that's all I need. Someone that I respect, that's all I need. And that, you know, it's going to happen. And uh, that's, I, I think Keith Crock, you know, really hits that when he talks about enable, enabling the others to act and encouraging their heart, modeling the way and, and uh, and uh, inspiring a shared vision and challenging the process. I think it all encompasses that. Right. And it really, for me, goes back to both engage, encourage, and power, and, and, and more importantly, mentorship. Yeah. So what you experienced and has done, done very well, has it? Been yeah. very helpful to you, right? Yeah, very much so. uh, that, uh, now, that leadership I just made, uh, the Mortimer, did you go to the leadership? Uh, class. I, I may have had something to do with that motto. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm in mortarboard this year. I've, okay. um, I've been blessed with the opportunity to do that. Sure. And talk about another phenomenal group. I mean, you get 40 students in there that that um, are um, the top of the senior class. And uh, let me back up for a moment. On in March, the beginning of March, March 6th, actually, we um, we had mortarboard selection. So the current class, the 40 students and the 39 of the students on I that are in the that are in the 2010 class selected the 2011 class. Not only did we take a very large population of nominations, um, well, first off, we, we received all these nominations. The executive committee pre-selected those, you know, the ones that didn't make their grade sure. cuts or X, Y, Z, to 160 students. And then we sat down for 18 hours and went through each and every single student and voted on them individually. And they had to receive 90% of the chapter's vote to get in. So we did that, and we finally got the 40th student at about midnight. On uh, it was yeah, Sunday that's morning, a big really. Big, big commitment. So seeing that and thinking about that's what happened last year, I just I can't imagine. I mean, if that happened last year, it's just really neat to see the quality of people there. And my peers, I, I I don't feel I don't feel like I should be in that group at all by any means. But but it's just a great group. And uh, one of the big events that they have each year is this leadership conference. And when we were brainstorming ideas, uh, this idea of, of um, providing sustainable solutions for tomorrow's leaders came up. And that goes back to the academic aspect that I mentioned a few moments ago and how we really need to be, um, in a sense, developing leaders for uh, sustainable solutions tomorrow, not teach, just teaching them the facts that they could regurgitate, because facts are going to change. There's the information about, you know, uh, five years out of college, what you learned in college really isn't relevant anymore. It's how you learn to learn. And that's what we need to be doing, and that's where um, I, that's what my hope was, and that's what I hope we accomplished with this leadership conference as far as providing sustainable solutions, that knowledge component of how to think differently and how to think critically to tomorrow's leaders, those leaders that are here at Purdue University. All right, so, who are going on. That are, who are going on. They're right. truly making the next, I mean, they're, they're a future generation. They're the next president of the United States. They're the next, you know, the military leaders, the XYZ, you name it. They're there. Right. So. Good. Uh, do you have a favorite uh, Purdue tradition? you like to share with us? That's a great question. One of my favorite traditions I got a chance to be in this year, is, maybe I'm a bit traditional, but is the senior chords. Um, it was, it's fun talking to Pre The reason I enjoy that so much is because of my involvement with Purdue Foundation Student Board. Homecoming, at homecoming, alumni that haven't been back to Purdue, haven't been to Purdue, um, meaning they've graduated many, many years ago, like 40 or 50 home. years, and they, they bring their cords back, and sometimes it's the button's undone and they're wearing pants underneath them and they've got a belt on them just to keep them on, but th th that's very, they take a lot of pride in that. Right. 
and, uh, and to see seniors now do that, I would love to see that tradition escalate even more than it is. They tried to bring it back some years ago, and it didn't. It didn't mm -hmm. fly again. And we have gotten a few in the archives, uh, the skirts and the pants. And yep. I had a student that worked for me a couple of years ago, and she made her own. And in the, <laughs> in the back, you know, the Purdue, the Boilermaker special. The, when she walks, it moves. <laughs> Great. Yeah. So I mean, it, it's, it's nice. Yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. It, there's. Uh, to hear alumni talk about it and then to see some some to students see. do it this year, it's just, it's a great right. thing. Um, tell us a little about what you're going to be doing this summer. Yeah, uh, this summer, even with the economy kind of not so fun for, for graduates, uh, was blessed with the opportunity to have an opportunity to, to work with a company called Black & Beach. It's an engineering consulting firm, and I'll be working specifically within the water division. Now, I interned with them last summer, and, and they came back and offered me again an internship this summer. But the fun part about this summer is we'll be in Singapore. So um, for, a, for a kid that grew up raising his, harvesting his own animals for, for, for food, I guess you could say, for, you know, for consumption, and uh, literally in, in four cornfields, going to Singapore is pretty exciting. Uh, I've been to Canada. That's my international experience, but I'm not quite sure that's international enough. <laughs> so this will be fun. But with that comes a, a fun opportunity even afterwards to work for Black & Beach uh, for, for a minimum of two years. Uh, it's a great company. I really enjoy um, the people that I got to meet last summer. And just, I mentioned mentorship is so huge to me. Just their focus on getting young people connected with older people that are right on that verge or right on that cusp of, of retirement, that have all the knowledge that's just going to, I don't want to say be wasted, but it's just going to be lost because they didn't take the opportunity. And they have a lot the young people and old people didn't take right. the opportunity to connect. Right. So uh, really looking forward to that. Good. And in closing, anything that I didn't ask or any comments that you'd like to make? Just one other comment. You right. mentioned the next, uh, in next stage, kind of the right. pre, yep, the next steps. I'll make this quick. Um, I mentioned the, the challenge between, the tension between one, uh, peop, being a people person and engineering and not so much, uh, engineering is not typically thought of a people oriented thing. Um, and that tension, uh, my freshman year, and, and I remember an interview that I had for a comm class. I had to interview different people and I chose to interview profession, pro, professors. I interviewed four professors, two in my department, two in ag and bioengineering, and two in agricultural economics. And I'll always remember uh, an interview with Dr. Bob Taylor. Uh, Dr. Taylor's been teaching since the mid-60s. I want to say either 62 or 67. It's one of those numbers. And um, it, he's just a phenomenal man. And, and he's the, the epitome of, of empowering students, so that engage, encourage, empower students. Had him in a class that year on Ag Econ 217. In, went to interview him. And we went through the typical interview sessions, you know, how did you become a professor? Did you always see yourself be a professor? What would have been the challenges? What have been the successes? What have been the exciting points? You know, the typical interview questions. At the end of it, we were just about to conclude. And he's like, Bruce, you've asked me a lot of questions. Now it's my turn. And he started to ask me questions and really, really challenging questions, not just, you know, the superficial stuff. Sure. Um, one of the questions he asked me was, Bruce, what do you want to do? What, what are your passions? And being fresh out of FFA, I kind of had my and I hate to say it, kind of canned answer. And he's like, it's a great answer, but what do you really want to do? And I think he saw through it. And I was like, you know what, I, I love to teach, and that's my heart's desire. I love to, it's an opportunity when someone asks me a question, I love to have the knowledge to give them a, 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 an accurate answer. I love to convey that, that my life experiences to someone else so they don't have to pay the dumb tax, if you will. And I remember that because um, right then he looked at me and said, Bruce, you need to take my job meaning become a professor. And before that point, I had never thought about that. I mean, I, I, had, I mean, um, you know, what, eight, eight years prior, I wasn't even sure, you know, sixth grade, wasn't even sure if I was going to be able to make it to college financially because my oldest brother, my, my, you know, my, my role model, if you will, just dropped out because he couldn't afford it. So that was a really neat thing. I had never thought about academia. But, but ever since that point and researching it more and more and more, that's become kind of my BHAG, and BHAG is a fun youth development term for big, hairy, audacious goal. So to say that differently, my big, hairy, audacious goal or BHAG is to be a professor someday, and that's long term. I don't see myself at, uh, as a, a typical engineer for, for long term, but I think that life experience will help motivate that goal of being able to connect real-world experiences to students to enhance their learning experience and also provide a little bit of backing for, for good mentorship with because the reality, if I, if I was a professor, the reality of, is, majority of the, is a majority of the students wouldn't be becoming a professor. They'd be going out to industry and doing things like that. So 
Um, that's really my, my motivation, and that's that's uh, that's the, that's where my eye is on the horizon. So that's one that's fun final thought. Good. That's mm-hmm. good. Thank you very much. I Thank really you very appreciate much, this. Very nice.